It's good to see you all here. Please stand for a call to worship. It's from Psalm 145. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all his promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. Let's sing about God's faithfulness this morning.
for God's faithfulness this morning. Again, it's great to see you all. Welcome online. We're happy everybody is here today. Trek kids, you are dismissed to the back. Everyone turn, give someone a friendly greeting this morning. Yeah, definitely friendly. Go for friendly. <laughs> don't know me, I'm Gail. Welcome to the journey today. Um, I don't have a connect card, just kidding, that's a lie. I do have a connect card. And you guys will also have connect cards if you go to a table, because that's where they are. So there's connect cards on the tables, and if, for those of you worshiping with us today in person, you can see those, um, and you can put your prayer requests and thanksgivings on the back. And if you're a guest and it's your first time filling out the card, we want to thank you by making a $5 donation to one of our partner organizations lifted, listed on the Connect card. And you can check which organization you want to have receive this $5, and we'll do that for you. And then if you have the prayers and thanksgivings, or if you're doing that uh, and you're new here, you can drop those in the boxes at the back of the room. And if you're online with us today, worshiping with us for the first time, we would love to hear from you as well. So you can connect with us online through email at info at journeyoflongmont.org. And on to the actual announcements. So tonight at 6 p.m. here at The Journey, uh, there's going to be an evening of worship through song led by our very own worship team. So you guys are all welcome and very encouraged to come tonight at 6. It's going to be, you can sing along or you can come and just listen and we'll raise our hearts and worship to God. For a little bit and then John I should have asked how to pronounce this Munyon I did it guys I'm so good all right is moving to a new house in Longmont he and his fiance Angela could really use our help in cleaning their new house so we're looking for volunteers to help them clean this Monday so that's tomorrow at 5 30 p.m. for a couple hours the address is listed in today's program and in the drawings and if you're able to help out you can contact whenever's to get that all sorted and they would I'm sure very much appreciate that uh, and then the journey has been asked to host a mops ministry, which is mothers of preschoolers. And I first heard about mops through Boz. I don't know if anyone knows what Boz is, but he's a big green bear and he teaches you about things when you're a preschooler and also Jesus. Does, I don't, so I don't know if anyone remembers Boz, but they always had like a, a mops ad before Boz played. And I was so annoyed because I was like, this is not my bear. <laughs> I don't care about the mothers of preschoolers. So. That was a nostalgic to hear that again. Anyway, so that's going to come to the church. Um, I don't think Boz is coming, but the mothers are. And someone from the community has stepped up to lead it, uh, recruit volunteers and run the program, but we need someone from the journey to take the oversight role. If you're interested, you can talk to Rick Evers or Alicia, Alicia Millers. Miller? I can't read. I'm illiterate. All right, we are so thankful for our many volunteers who make the journey that place that it is. It's because of you guys and your willingness to use your gifts that we can continue to be a place for rest, refreshment, friendship, and your, and your support. I'm, I am just illiterate. Rest, refreshment, friendship, and support for each other and, our, and for our community. We want to celebrate the ministries of the journey with a barbecue right after service Sunday, May 22nd, which I believe is next week. Um, maybe I can't count either got a lot going for me. Please join us. Bring a side or a dessert to share if you so choose. We will provide burgers and hot dogs. Someone should bring um, pasta salad because it's really good. <laughs> There's my recommendation in case anyone was wondering of something they should bring. All right, and then you can check out today's program or this week's drawings for more details on the announcements as well as additional announcements or just to actually read and understand them because apparently I can't and I can't <laughs> portray it. But you know what? There you go. So there's, those are there if you're looking for that. And then for our offering, offering and tithe partner highlight, we thank you for your continued giving. Uh, many of the ways to give are listed on the screens to side of me. And if you're here today in person, you also have the option of dropping your offering in the boxes next to the doors back of this room. 
And here the journey, we give back 10% of what God has blessed us with as a church family to one of our tithe recipients. Today we are highlighting our tithe partner, the Mission and Ministry Fund. And then if you want to receive the journey jottings, which is the weekly email announcements, the weekly prayer requests, and or would like to submit, submit new and updated prayer requests, you can contact Glenda Faust at glenda at journeyoflongmont.org. All right. And now we'll start our wonderful sermon. <laughs> Thanks, Gail. Appreciate that. Gail has discovered the power of the mic. <laughs> so, <clears throat> who's volunteering for pasta salad next week? All right, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Got you covered there, Gail. Well, welcome. It is good to be with you all this morning. Uh, we do have just a couple of more things. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do is this morning, as you can see, uh, if you're here, we're having communion. And uh, it's set up just a little bit differently. Uh, we've been going through various iterations because of COVID and all the rest. And so this week we are bringing back uh, being able to come forward and be served communion. Uh, so with intinction, that's one of those things where you take the piece of bread and you dip it into the cup and then take it. Uh, so myself and one of our lead team members, Lydia, will be up here, uh, but we also have a few cups uh, in the middle. If you choose not to do that, you certainly may come forward and grab a piece of bread out of the bowl and take a cup. Uh, so it's all gluten-free. Uh, so therefore, you, uh, un unless you have an aversion to that, then sorry, you're stuck. Um, but we should be good. This week, like we do every week as well, we uh, pray for a couple of churches, one that's here in town and one that's part of our region of churches that's part of the Christian Reformed Church. We do this for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, we really want to, um, to continue to propagate the idea that we are not a church uh, amidst the competition of churches in this city, but we are one church in this town. Uh, we come from a variety of different backgrounds. Uh, we all have uh, different giftings and different purposes that God has called each of us to. And when we function within the context of who we are, we get to be able to be a part of what God's doing in this city. But when we recognize each other and recognize that we're all part of Christ's body, uh, that's, a, that's a powerful witness and testimony in that. And so we wanna be able to pray for our other brothers and sisters in this city. But we also wanna recognize that we're a part of a, a, a body of believers ourselves, our particular tribe. Um, Christian Reformed Church, and we want to be able to support for, uh, pray for the support of those brothers and sisters as well. So this morning we're praying for Niwot United Methodist Church, uh, as well as our sister Christian Reformed Church, Emmanuel Christian Reformed Church, which is just north of us in Fort Collins. And then we're praying for all the ministry that takes place in the Ministry and Mission Fund. Uh, we also want to continue to pray for Chelsea Boltheis. Uh, she's, uh, she'll be 11 weeks pregnant. Um, but has been having some complications with her pregnancy, so we continue to pray for that. Um, continue to pray for Michelle Newman's niece, Stephanie, who's in hospice care with stage four renal failure. And uh, with all of that, let's take the rest of this service to God in prayer. Pray with me. Lord, I want to thank you so much that we get to be able to gather here uh, in this place and online and to recognize that we are a part of your family as people who've been bought by your blood. And so this morning, we pray that you will meet us in this moment. Lord, you, you were already here before we showed up. You walked in with us when we came. You'll leave with us when we go. And all of this is because your desire to have us be close to you. So may we hear your words this morning, Lord, your thoughts. May we be drawn to you. We pray this through the power of your holy name. Amen. This morning I'm going to start by reading out of Matthew 16. Matthew 16, 21 through 28. Um, you can find that in the programs if you have one or if you're got your uh, mobile device, you can look up the line if you've got a Bible app. Uh, I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation. 
So Matthew 16, beginning at verse 21. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem, that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders and the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him, saying such things, for saying such things, heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. And what would it do to benefit the whole world and lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. And I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Lord of God. Bait and switch. I get annoyed by bait and switch. Clickbait on social media. You think you're getting something? Ooh, oh man, it's an advertisement for something you don't want or don't need, or hopefully not a nefarious website. Right? I've kind of learned not to do that. But bait and switch, that's just one of those things that just has always kind of driven me crazy. Tell me what you want. Tell me what you got. You know, if I, if I want to listen, I'll listen. If I don't, I don't. Gwen and I have been married for about a year, and we got invited out to dinner by this super nice couple, and they were like, oh, we just love to get to know you better, it's be great, so we went out, to, went out to dinner, had a terrific time at, you know, a nice restaurant, and about 25 minutes in, they were like, hey, what we really wanted to do was we wanted to let you know about this great multi-level marketing opportunity. And I was like, look, I, I, I have no opinion about multi-level marketing. If you want to do that, that's fine. That's great. Right? What drove me crazy was we got invited to dinner to get to know us. And really what it was was a, a business proposal. And maybe I was annoyed because it was in a season of life where I was getting a lot of those. You know, hey, Rick, let's grab a cup of coffee. Hey, Rick, let's go do this. Hey, Rick, let's go do that. And then there was always this wonderful business opportunity that was there. I'm like, look, if you just had told me, hey, Rick, I'd love to grab coffee. I want to tell you about this great business opportunity that I have and I'd just love to share it with you. I'm a sucker for a cup of coffee. I'll listen to you. I'm fine if that's the cost of a cup of coffee. I'm good. Right? And then I can listen, and who knows, maybe this time it'll be one of those opportunities where I'll be like, sounds good. But most of the time that happens, and it just it leaves such a sour taste in my mouth that I didn't even want to hear what was being offered. Well, it's funny, because sometimes I think that this is how people view the gospel. That we can come across as a bait and switch. You know, you can hear about it, and again, I, stuff that I grew up with as a kid, um, you know, in high school, and, and you know, you would hear people uh, give, the, give the gospel presentation and how life would just be so much better if you just accepted Jesus. And it didn't take me long to realize that, my, that I had accepted Jesus and I was still struggling with stuff in life. I was still having a difficult time, like, wait a minute, where does that fit? Or you'll hear things, I mean, I've even preached this, right, where you come across Jesus and it's like, listen, the, the gospel is free. It's free. It's a gift. You don't have to earn salvation. It's a free gift from God. It's out of the goodness of his heart and the love of his creation. I've said that because I believe it's true. I've said things like, there is nothing you can do to make God love you more, and there's nothing you can do to make God love you less, which sounds amazing. And it is true. 
And then you heard me, if you were here a couple of weeks ago, you heard me talk about how God loves us like his kids. And that he delights in us like we delight in our kids. In fact, I, and I pulled this from my sermon. I said that one of the reasons we've been doing this whole Falling for God series is because I wanted to connect with the heart of God and to discover a God who wanted to make me feel free to play again, to be adventurous again, and that he delighted in the idea of it. And I love that. And I believe it's true. And then you read Matthew 16. If any of you wants to be my follower, if any of you wants to be my follower, he has to learn how to use technology. If any of you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me, which sounds like the exact opposite of a father delighting in watching his child play. Is this bait and switch? And suddenly it feels like adult time. And yet this is what I believe wholeheartedly. That Jesus does not do bait and switch. He told people straight up what it meant to follow him. He told people straight up what was going to happen. That was part of this passage, right? Hey, guys, I'm coming. I'm going to get killed. I'm going to get beaten. And I'm going to rise again three days later. But if you want to follow me, then you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. Is this bait and switch? No. I actually preached this passage uh, for one of my evangelistic preaching classes. Uh, we had two evangelistic preaching classes in seminary. Um, the first one that I preached, I, this is my first sermon, was this passage. Uh, yep, that's right. Because why not? Uh, I preached this passage along with Matthew 14. Maybe you remember the, uh, those two stories where Jesus says, hey, um, if you're going to follow me, you got to count the cost. So uh, don't be like some guy that builds a house and then halfway through building the house runs out of money. Like you're going to, if you're going to build a house, you're going to make sure that you have all the money ahead of time. Otherwise, you're just going to be sitting with a, with a building with a foundation, kind of like that house in Gun Barrel, that building in Gun Barrel, right, where there's just like this basement and foundation and there's no building. And if you guys know, on 63rd, there is a place where there is like, a building that's a basement and it has been there I, I, we've been here 20 almost 23 years it's just a hole in the ground and I every time I see that I think oh there's somebody that ran out of money <laughs> and there it sits to be used by skateboarders and that's it Jesus is like don't do that hey, look what king is gonna go fight a battle unless he figures he can win and if he can't win then he sends his envoys right count the cost. Know what you're getting into. And maybe it was because I've been around too many of non-believing friends that when I talked about Jesus, they'd give me some story about where they heard some sort of, it felt like a bait and switch MLM marketing pitch. And I just didn't want to do that. So I got done with my sermon and, uh, you know, class of like 12 people and my prof looks at me and says, well, Rick, that's a first. I don't think I've ever heard that passage used in an evangelistic sermon class before, nor have I heard anybody try to talk people out of the gospel. <laughs> that's a unique perspective. <laughs> Got an A, just, just so you know. A minus. Could have improved my presentation, apparently. Anyway. The thing is, is that following Jesus isn't easy. Following Jesus has never been easy. In fact, there have been times when following Jesus is just downright hard. Sometimes it's because we read stuff, because Jesus says stuff, and it leaves us scratching our head like, what? What, the, what am I supposed to do with that? What does that even mean? How does, how does that fit in my life? And there's other times that following Jesus means that, you know, because of 
uh, what it means to follow him. And there's a part where like, oh man, I'm, I'm not sure I'm ready to go there. Like if that's the implication, that's, am, am I really ready to give that part up? And other times it's hard to stay focused on him because our life is falling apart at the seams and we've got this thing in the back of our minds that's like, isn't following Jesus supposed to make my life better? Then how come my life sucks right now? And has for a while. I mean, following Jesus is not an easy thing to do. And I think Jesus knew that. And that's why he said we should always know what we're getting ourselves into. When we put our lives in his hands. And here's the truth. Putting our lives in Jesus' hands is having the Father run to us to bring us back home after we wandered off like the prodigal son. And putting our lives in Jesus' hands is like having the Father come find us when we're sulking like the older brother. But it also means that like a child, we put our whole life in the Father's hands and trust him with it. And this is the hard part because we've become adults. We grow up and we start grasping and hiding because we start trusting less. The older we become, the more we live life, the more it doesn't fit what preconceived notion we might have, the more obstacles we bump up against, the more we become adults and we forget what it means to live as children. Again, I love this when Jesus said, let the little children come to me and we should be like children and he didn't describe that. He didn't describe what that is because it allows us to be able to, to play with it a bit. Be able to go, what does it mean to come with him as if like a child? And as I thought about that passage inside of this context of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, that we must give up our way and take up our cross and follow him, to be like a child, to put our whole life in the Father's hands and trust him with it, what does that mean? What is Jesus inviting us to? And I think... It's just important to stop here for one second. Jesus never coerces. If you ever come across anything within the context of the Christian tradition, in the context of following Jesus, that is coercion, that is twisting your arm, that is not from God. That is not from Jesus. What Christ does is calls, he invites. He never forces. And so what God is doing here, even in this line, if you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take your cross and follow me. That's an invitation. You can reject it. That's the thing about an invitation. You can go, yeah, no. And what Jesus does is he's inviting us to become as children. And think about it. What do children do? What do we do as kids? I was thinking about this. Put it in this context for a minute. Oh, this is what it did for me. It's like I had this memory as I was thinking, like, what does it mean to be a child of God? And I remember it's like thinking about my own kids. Right? And I've got this picture of my of my house in California, and my kids are like three and one going four and two just before we move here, and they're running around the house, and, and they are safe in that context. And in that context, what is their expectation of me as a young dad at 33, 34, right? And you're like, first of all, like, who in the world thought like giving young people kids is a smart idea? Right? Oh my word. I mean, I, I look at that. I remember holding Austin for the first time going, I don't know what to do with this thing. Like, when is the person who's in charge coming to take this child away and take care of it? And yet from that moment on, there I am. And what do I get to do as a parent? 
right? I get to feed, clothe, protect my kid and provide a place. And yet, when you take a look at my kids, two and four, their expectation of me, their trust in me was that I would feed them. Right? As a kid, we trust our parents to clothe us. We trust our parents to protect us. We trust our parents to provide a place for us to eat and to sleep and to play. I mean, think about this. This is even into, even into high school, right? You get some kid that walks in and he opens up the cupboards. There's nothing to eat. Why? Because there's an expectation that you as a parent will have food in the cupboard. Preferably food that they would like as opposed to the chucked full cupboard already full of food. That's like, there's plenty of food. No, there's not. Right? And parents, you expect clothing. I still have this picture in my mind of one of my kids walking out of the bedroom with, with like three pieces of clothes going like, and, you know, and in a diaper, like going like, dress me. Like there, but there it was, it wasn't like they were coming to me like, where's my clothes? It was like, here are my clothes, dress me. Right? That we trust our parents to protect us, that we provide a place for us. The fact that we have a, a place to stay is a given. If everything's going well, that we trust our parents in every part of our lives. This is what our little kids do. This is what we do. And in fact, one of the, one of the issues that we have as we get older, right, is when we discover our parents have flaws, <laughs> we begin to see them as like real people. Because things don't always go the way we want. Things, hard things come, and then what happens is we become an adult, right? And what do we do as an adult? We worry about what we're going to eat, and so we grasp to provide it. We worry about what we're going to wear, and we buy the right clothes to hide who we are. And we worry about protecting ourselves and defend ourselves against others, and we worry about where we're going to live, and we make sure that what we have is equal to and preferably more than what other people have. And we struggle for it, and we grasp for it, and we hide behind it, because this is what we do as adults. Because we've discovered that life isn't fair, and we've discovered that life is hard, and we've discovered that life throws you curves, and you, and you can't trust. And yet Jesus, invites us back with these difficult words that if you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. And it's inviting us to a different kind of life. It's inviting us to a life that looks like it may be a life lacking, but it actually is a life that is full and complete and deeply satisfying because it is intimately connected to him. No matter where we are, no matter what we're experiencing in life. But to enter into this life, we're invited to look at our lives and see what needs to be put to death that allows us to live life with Jesus with the trust of a little child. I'm going to say that again. Because this is what Jesus does. He invites us to look at our lives and see what needs to be put to death so that we can live life with Jesus with the trust of a little child. One of the stories that gets to the heart of this, right, is the story of the rich young ruler, the rich young man that comes to Jesus. You know the story, it's out of Matthew 19. Rich young man comes to Jesus and says, Teacher, what good deed must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus is like, so what do you ask about what's good? There's only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Which one? And Jesus said, well, you must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not testify falsely. Honor your father and your mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, I've obeyed all these commands, the young man replied. What else must I do? Jesus told him, well, if you want to be perfect, go and sell 
all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And there it is. Come, follow me. Mike, can you help me out with, push that PowerPoint forward? If you want to be my follower, come follow me. Give up your own way. Put on your cross. This young man's money, his wealth, all that was attached to it, this is his adult life. It was the thing and things that kept him from living in the freedom of living as a child of God. And he went away because he wanted to live the adult life and to hang on to all the things that he had gained for himself. I mean, this guy is not that, I mean, this guy could live in North America. In some ways, this guy could be me. You know, with his money, he knew that he could eat where he wanted to eat and eat what he wanted to eat. With his money, he knew he could wear what he wanted to wear. With his money, he knew that he could stay where he wanted to stay, live where he wanted to live. And I think one of the reasons that he left is because of fear. Because who is he without his money? And what's he going to eat without his money? And what is he going to wear without his money, let alone have a choice in what he's going to wear? And where is he going to live without his money? Who is he going to be without his money? Without money, he's vulnerable, without protection. Let me say that again. Without his way, he is vulnerable and without protection. Which is exactly what a child is all on its own. Unless it has a good father, a good parent, a good brother. The young man didn't trust Jesus like a child because he had become an adult. And what Jesus asks us is, who are we? Are we kids or are we adults? To be a child is to trust that God has us in everything. And to be an adult means that we are grasping and clinging and hiding. I hate those questions. I mean, I love them because they're piercing, and I hate them because they're piercing. It's like, oh, I want to be able to trust God in everything. In fact, this is one of those things. I had a pastor when I was in seminary uh, when we were living in Grand Rapids, George Muscle. He was awesome. One of the reasons why I love George Muscle, one of the reasons I love him so much is because he would get up and he would say stuff like, I hate that this passage is in the Bible, like, because this is hard. <laughs> it's like I'd never heard a pastor say that before. Like, can you say that about the Bible? Can you say that you don't like things that are in the, it's the Bible? You can't talk that way about the Bible. You know? And then I'm discovered, oh, yeah, because you gotta preach this stuff. And you preach this stuff, and you get like people like, oh, you must have it together because you preach this. No, this terrifies me. To live as a child and trust God in everything, I have been everything in this world disciples us to be adults. And we even take scripture and be able to use it to, to manipulate that because we say things like, we want to be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Paul says, you know, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, and, you know, did stuff like a child, and I gave up my childish ways. It's just bait and switch. Because to be mature, it's not bait and switch. Because to be mature in God is to actually recognize who we really are, to recognize our absolute condition. Our absolute condition, folks, is that we are vulnerable and without protection as we are. We play the adult game, but the focus is our money doesn't provide us security. Because it can go away like that. 
<laughs> I mean, we've watched that. What's inflation at right now? What does it cost to fill up my truck with gas? You know, what's just happened to all of our retirement accounts on the stock market in the last couple of weeks? Our money has just gone away. It goes away. Oh, we have it, but ooh, do we? Our clothes wear out, or worse, they go out of style. All of the things that we try to find security in is like a, it's like a security blanket. It, it gives us a sense of security, but there is none. Unless we come to God as a child and we recognize that in him is our everything. The life that Jesus invites us into, to give up our own way, to take up our cross and to follow him, is the path to a life of deeper intimacy and connection with God, where we get to set aside our false security blankets and live in and be enveloped by the realness of God's love. I heard a story uh, a bunch of years ago that illustrates this point well. There was a little girl who had a, a faux pearl necklace. She loved this pearl necklace. We got it for her birthday. It was the first thing she put on in the morning, the last thing she took off at night. She loved her pearl necklace. She wore it everywhere. In fact, one of the reasons I kind of like this story is because um, Paige, when she was three, stood up in a wedding and had this beautiful little uh, blue chiffon dress that was so adorable. And she wore that thing every day, all summer from that point on, right? It was this beautiful little dress and she tore the snot out of it, right? By the time it was done, it was, it was just beautiful. So was like, we do this thing, little child, right? So she's got this beautiful little faux pearl necklace. She just loves it. And one night the dad's tucking her in and, and he says, hey, sweetheart, you know I love you, right? She's like, yeah, Dad. I love you too. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Hey, sweetie, if you love me, would you give me your necklace? And the girl looks at her and is like, oh, Dad, I, I love you. I, can, I, I can't give you my necklace. Oh, that's okay. That's okay, sweetie. I love you. Good night. Tucks her in. A few nights later, comes in, same routine. Hey, sweetheart, I love you. I love you too, Dad. Hey, sweetheart, if you love me, would you give me your necklace? Ah, oh, Dad, I, I, I can't give you my necklace. Oh, okay, sweetheart, I love you. Good night. And every few nights over the course of the next couple weeks, he would do this. And when I got to that part of the story, I'm reading this, I'm like, what a horrible dad. This is terrible. Like, I didn't want to finish reading the story, but, you know, I got sent to me, and I'm going to read it. But it's like, oh, like, oh my goodness. I am so uncomfortable with this story. I mean, what kind of a dad is this? This is like tantamount to some kind of emotional abuse, isn't it? This is the definition of conditional love, or something that comes across that way. I'm like, oh, man. Just inter it's funny, because I can still even feel in my stomach like how I felt when I first heard that story, when I thought of telling this story last night. I was like, oh, I don't like this story. It always leaves me with this, uh, my stomach at this point. Because it's just, oh. But I kept reading. I get to this point. Right? So one night the dad comes into the little girl's room and she's sitting on the edge of her bed and she's crying. And he goes, like, honey, what's wrong? And from behind her back, she pulls out her necklace and she says, here, dad, I love you. And he's like, oh, sweetheart. You have no idea what that means to me. Ah, oh, thank you so much. And he really gently and carefully takes this necklace from her and he puts it in his pocket. And then he reaches behind and he pulls out of his back pocket this long rectangle box and he hands it to her and he says, here, honey, this is for you. And she opens up the box 
And here inside the box is this strand of a real pearl necklace. And he says, and this is how much I love you and more. Jesus does not pull a bait and switch on us. But what Jesus does is invites us to give up all of our faux security, all of our false security. What Jesus invites us to is to give up playing adult and living into who he is and the incredible gifts that he has for us. He doesn't come up showing up, offering one thing, and then hits us with terms and conditions. That's not what this is. Oh yeah, come be my child, but lay down your life. The invitation is to put to death the thing that keeps us from him. The invitation is to take the very thing that is killing us and choking us and restraining us from living in the freedom of Jesus and putting that to death so that we can actually live a real, full life with him. When Jesus calls us and invites us to give up our own way and take up our cross and follow him, he wants to give us in return the greatest joy we could imagine, whatever our life circumstances are. And here's the thing. Jesus gave up his own way for us to do this. That's another thing that blows me away about Jesus. He never asks us to do something that he hasn't done already. When he says, look, hey, give up your own way, take up your cross and follow him, Jesus is saying, look, I'm just asking you to do what I've done. Jesus gave up his own way. Jesus, as Philippians 2 reminds us, did not consider equality with God something to cling to. He didn't come here going, hey, I'm gonna prove that I'm God. He set that aside. And he carried his cross. In fact, that's something here to remember, folks. Jesus isn't calling you to carry his cross. He's calling you to carry yours. Because you can't carry his. Only he could carry his cross. His cross was the cross that bore our sin, that bore the evil and the brokenness of the entirety of this universe. All the brokenness from the beginning of time until the end of time went onto his shoulders. That's what this is about. This is about the recognition that Jesus did not follow his own way, but followed the way of the Father. And that Jesus took up his cross. <clears throat> This is what he did for us. This is the beauty of this table. This table, this table is what heals us. Uh, not in the bread and the juice in and of itself, but what it represents. This table, when we accept it into ourselves as children and not as adults, this sacrifice on Jesus' part is what's brings us to the place where we can trust God. When we say, I believe this, I believe that Jesus, God himself came in the flesh and lived life like we live it. And then went to the cross and had his body broken and pierced and his blood shed. He did this to invite us into a life with him as his children. So that, 
Here's the beauty of this. Jesus went to the cross gladly because he knew at the end he'd get you. I want you to hear that again. He went to the cross gladly because he knew that at the end of that, he got you. The real healed you. This is what he is inviting us to. So for the next few moments, we're going to have an opportunity just to be with God together as individuals. Beautiful thing that happens when we do that. That we all in this moment get to gather together and pray, and yet we can trust that God listens to us and and encounters us and interacts with us individually in this moment. And to be able to spend some time and ask this question. What's my way that needs to die? What's the cross that I'm carrying that allows me to quit living as an adult and start living as a children, as a child that fully trusts God? What does it mean for me to follow him? Spend the next few moments just spending time praying that. And then Doug's going to come up and he's going to close us in prayer. And after that prayer, he's going to invite you forward. And inviting you forward, you get to take the bread, which represents Christ's body. And you get to take it, and you get to eat it, and you get to remember and believe and trust that this is what he did for you. And then you take the juice, and either drink the juice or dip the bread in the juice, and you get to drink the cup that represents Christ's shed blood is a new covenant that he makes for you. And in all of this, he says, take this, eat this, drink this, and remember me. Because I want you. Let's go to God in prayer, shall we? God, thank you. God, thank you for all the things that you do in our lives to bring us to the point of once again being your children. Lord, in these next few moments, will you draw us to you? And will you meet us in that moment and show us what are the things in our lives that are keeping us from you? What's what's my way that needs to go to the cross and die there so I can live with you as your child. Lord, meet us in these next moments and hear our prayers.
today we come, we come to this table and we remember. Lord, we remember first that we are lost. We are sinners, we are separated from God. We were in death by sin. We had no way back. And we remember our wonderful Father that you made a way. You gave your Son, Jesus, who came to us to save us, to make the way back to you. Lord, today, this table, we remember. Jesus, what he did, his sacrifice, and your love for us. And we praise you and raise his name. In Jesus' name, amen. Please come forward as you're ready.
we worship you this morning because of who you are as the great God of the universe but God we also worship you this morning because of all you've done for us because of your great gift to us and because of your invitation to live with you like our good father to live as your children 
or the parent we can trust. So Lord, today as we leave this place, will you do two things in us through this Holy, your Holy Spirit? And the first is, Lord, will you remind us whenever we encounter those, those moments where we want to act as the adult, will you remind us that you invite us to be your child? And Lord, will you remind us that the reason you do is because you are always with us, the one we can trust. Lord, thank you for being with us this morning and the confidence that you leave with us. And we pray this, Lord, in your holy name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, to go with God because you realize he is always with you. To go in his grace because of his love, his mercy because of his justice, to walk with you every step that you take. Go in his grace, his peace, and in his name. Have a great week. See you next week. You are great. Worship you. I worship you.